I smell the fresh green chilies. The flavor is not that hot. Mm. We take the seeds out mm. from Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> Minnesota. It's the state where I grew up. 80% white, 70% Christian, 100% afraid of spice. So how does a place like this become home to over 50,000 folks from Somalia, the largest Somali population in the USA? Today, I'm on the hunt for one of Africa's most mysterious cuisines. As soon as you walk in, the whole room is just filled with this amazing aroma. Are these foods that you would even see all in one meal? This is just the bench team, actually. This is the bench? When do we eat the team? So, coming soon. And finding it in the least likeliest of places. So anything I want, that we all share together. Yes, but don't, don't expect me to feed you. you know. no. <laughs> it all starts here. walking down the street of a bustling city in Somalia, you would likely come upon street food that looks like this. It's bright, it's bold, and today it's the perfect culinary entry point. I'm so pumped to be here right now. There's two different foods. They're both kind of a blazed Cheeto orange. Can we try this? Yes. This high energy blaze orange card ball can be purchased in Somalia for pennies. It's made by stuffing half a hard boiled egg into mashed potatoes. Then it's rolled into a ball. The ball is dipped in a thin, vibrant orange mixture to give it some color and texture as it fries. There's also a veg option. No egg, just straight steamed and sliced potato, also dipped, also fried. Served with a spicy, sweet, and somewhat tart tamarind sauce. Mmm, I love that sauce. So the potatoes, it's steamed, it's soft, it's really big and thick. A little crunch on the outside. Was the spice coming from here or yeah, from there? Spicy for him. This is beyond like Minnesota spice. You have white people come here and eat this? Yes. Milo Restaurant and Bakery has been operating here for 12 years. They offer a taste of nostalgia to those who crave the foods they grew up with that aren't easily found in Minneapolis. At the helm, Mama Wilo and her son Abdi. There's one more on here. They call this nafaho. It's basically a protein on the run. Next to him, Jamal, a Somali-American chef who will be joining me throughout this journey. But more on him later. Give it a dip. You know, they do something similar in the Philippines yeah. where they have a natto oil and they color some of the food bright orange like this. If you just have a brown potato, it's not going to be as appealing, but this is just blaze orange. It gets people's attention. It's big. And this is going to be feeling like I'm... Yeah. <laughs> it's like half a pound over here. Mmm. It's like a giant fried mashed potato ball. It's not even crunchy, it's frying it, just kind of gives it a skin that you break through and then right in the middle, half a hard boiled egg to kind of break it up, mix that with a dip. That's very nice. So you dip again. Double dipping is okay. I, I'm doing it, I'm like looking at you. Are you gonna look at me? Double dipping all the way. Man. All right. You can get your fingers in there, you know what I mean? Just, it's, just gets better, man. <laughs> You were born in Somalia. Yes, I was born in Somalia. And at what age did you come here? I came in age when I was 15 years old. So you still fully remember all the sights and foods and smells of Somali food in Somalia? Yes. Food in Somalia is a melting pot of different cultural influences, as Somali people are traditionally semi-nomadic or nomadic. So main diets, beans, making it with a spinach, making it on a, a bean stew. Much of their cuisine reflects the influences of East African, Indian, Persian, and Arab food. As a result of European colonization during the 19th century, they've added even more to their food list. He said every Friday back home is pasta day. What kind of pasta? So basically spaghetti, but the way they do it is sort of like a stir fry, and they add a bunch of different ingredients to it. It's very aromatic as well. But with a foundation of ancient Somali techniques, their creations are still something uniquely all their own. This is like a wild assortment, a smorgasbord of just tons of random foods. Is this like the greatest hits of Somalia? This is partial. More than 99% of Somalia is Muslim. If you're wondering what that has to do with the food in front of us, I can explain. Devout Muslims must adhere to a strictly halal diet, meaning no alcohol, no pork, and partaking only in meats that have been slaughtered the proper way. This is a key thing. Oh. Bananas are must because we eat so many different flavors of food. Bananas are sort of to reset your palate. The idea is to get a little bit of everything out of one scoop. Does it matter if I'm using my right or left hand? The right hand always. Okay. Why do you think that is? Um, because this is my toilet paper? Toilet paper. Okay. Exactly. Let's just eat. <laughs> First up, ribs. 
To be precise, goat ribs, braised forever in spices, then fried, then pan-seared in flaming glory. That shares a plate with some pasta. I lived in Minnesota for 24 years before I moved to Asia. I never had goat here once. I didn't know it was possible. Oh. Wow, this is heavenly. No game it tastes. No, none at all. Just really complete flavor. I almost, I'm tempted to say it's smoky, but it's not smoky. It's like you could taste the fire that went into it. I'm sorry, did you mix in spaghetti? So I grabbed the meat. Yeah, I'll grab the spaghetti. Now you got the banana in there. Jeez, okay. It's a learning process. It's okay to suck at new things. Here we go. <laughs> a little kind of savory marinara mixed with some very sweet banana, but ooh, that goat changed my life. Next, tilapia. The meat is scored, so it's easier to grab onto later. Then it's coated in a deep red sauce blend, including vinegar, hot sauce, saffron, and gato masala. Now, it's ready to fry. We have the longest coastline in Africa, so seafood is a mandatory in all our meals as well. Mm, good balance of meaty and fishy, fresh citrusy sourness on the outside. Our tilapia friend shares a plate with a mound of aromatic basmati rice. And the rice alone has layers of spices going on in here. So you got cardamom, you got cumin, you got coriander, you got onions, garlic, olive oil, ghee butter. It is layered with flavors. Mmm, really fragrant, fresh, aromatic cardamom. I can like taste it up through my nose. I'm starting to see the balance now with the banana, with the citrus, with the cardamom. Like, I am genuinely blown away. I didn't know what to expect. I want to talk about you. Absolutely. Jamal is a second-generation Somali-American. He's a chef, entrepreneur, and a culinary instructor. But most people know him for his cuisine, which bridges the gap between traditional African food and casual American dining. You were born in Somalia. Right. How long have you been in Minnesota? I moved to Minnesota in 96. I'm so curious. Minnesota has a, a huge Somali population, yeah. actually more than any other state. Any other state. Why Minnesota? With some of the USA's coldest winters, Minnesota is perhaps the least likely place you'd expect to find tens of thousands of African refugees. Let's back up a bit. In the early 1990s, a civil war broke out in Somalia, forcing an exodus of Somali people who came to the USA over the next few decades. With the help of the State Department and local volunteer resettlement agencies, they were settled all over the country. My family, when we came to Minnesota, we were living in Virginia prior to this, and we just could not fit and it just seemed too fast paced and it wasn't a very uh, accommodating environment when Somalis were located to Minnesota for opportunities for minor social services to get to put into the through the door educational right. and you know all of those things were lining up so everyone came here gradually from all over the world not only within America mm. to come and live particularly Minnesota and have this sense of community so it started because there's more opportunity more here. opportunities for sure and then uh, so many up. families come and then there's a tipping point where this is the place to go that's it Na 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 gonna take my time. Jamal, yeah, what's up, brother? Where are we at now? We are at Hanby Cafe today. We're gonna be trying out some of my best options when it comes to Somali tea. Tea? Tea. Okay. You think you know tea? Well, not this kind. This is Somali tea, or sha. Sha means spiced tea with milk, with black tea as a base, flavored with aromatic spices like cardamom, cloves, cinnamon, and fresh ginger. Then a layer of goat milk on top of that. This has caffeine? This has caffeine. I'm tingling. It's okay to get a little mustache going too. Yeah. Once you sip it, go for it. Mm, it's a goat latte, I love it. It's shaw, it's tea, it's sugary, fragrant. It's got the cardamom in there, just like our rice. It's such an awesome mix of flavors. Let's talk about where we are right now. What is this place? So this is how I get my dose of Africa. This is one of the first Somali hubs. You'll find every array of Somali culture. You don't have to travel abroad or any of that. Just come in here, you're back to Africa. Carmel Mall is the first and largest Somali shopping center in the USA, housing over 100 Somali shops and restaurants, including Wila and Hamdi. This place, over 20 years old and still expanding, is the heart of the Somali community in Minneapolis, a hub where the unique needs of the people here can be met all in one place. <laughs> They have goods, food, drinks, clothes. You can get a quick trim while also having a place to worship. 
that seems like it's perfectly suited to the unique needs of the Somali people living here. Because I'm seeing barber shops. I mean, if you went to a Great Clips, well, you don't have any hair. Maybe you're not a good example. But if another young Somali man with a lot of hair, he goes to a Great Clips, are they going to know what to do? No. They'd be confused. How do we cut this hair? They'd be you know, Googling it. Absolutely. Tutorials. Absolutely. You know, there's like this dirty A word, like assimilate. Mm -hmm. Just do what everyone else does. Mm -hmm. Do you think having a place like this stops people from integrating in with the greater mainstream not culture? All. Not at all. I think that what America presents essentially is you know, everyone bring a little bit of their culture. Like when you go to New York, you have Little Italy, you have Chinatown. So this is, you know, similar to that. We're uh, the new immigrants that came later in the years, but have a lot to contribute to the, you know, whether it's food, the clothing, the culture, you know? So this is a, a presentation. So I think the simulation part is still there because we live in America. Um, but the other part is that you don't lose part of yourself as well. So this gives us a way for us to hang out to our culture, our heritage, but also while we're not denying that there is another culture outside of ours as well, which is the American culture which consists of melting pot of every culture. There are quite possibly no two things more American than immigrants and entrepreneurs. Some Somali businessmen and women focus on meeting the needs of others in their own community, while others are building a bridge to bring Somali culture to mainstream America, like Miriam Muhammad, who helped turn a modest Somali snack food into a booming business. Thank you so much for having us here. The whole room is just yes. filled with this amazing aroma. I can't wait any longer. Can we try some yes, of this? Yes, please, go ahead. Sambusa. This sumptuous, savory fried pastry looks and sounds a bit similar to the word samosa, India's famous fried and stuffed creation. But this has a twist. Mm. India, they use potatoes in the fillings. In our culture, meat is the main dish. Not just any meat, this is beef, and a lot of it. Sauteed chopped onions, seasoned with a mixture of garlic, cumin, ground coriander, crushed red chilies, salt, and turmeric. The flavor is not that salty as well as not hot, mm. because we did it for Minnesota. Mm. Minnesotans do not like spice, that's what we are told. Stuff the meat inside a wrapper made from wheat flour dough, fold, then seal it shut, producing a perfect three-dimensional triangle. Deep fry until golden brown, and if at all possible, eat it while it's hot. Oh, there's so much I want to say. Let me just talk about the taste. Amazing flaky outer yeah. crust. When you bite in, you just get a huge mouthful of oily, delicious beef, and then you just get a hit of all those spices working together. It's just such a nice flavor. It's so satisfying. Yeah. I'm curious, where is this found in Somalia? Is this street food? Is this something people are making at home? And does it have that much beef? Well, not. I mean, so in Somalia, you don't make them every day because it's labor intensive. Sambusa is a favorite in Somali homes during Ramadan, a month where Muslims fast from sunrise to sunset. As kids, we used to wait for that. That's the only time we used to make, and weddings. Mm. But this is not the case. In here in the Twin City, people love to eat it all the time. Miriam is the co-founder of Hoya Sambusa. After six years of operations with the goal of employing and empowering Somali women, Hoyo now produces like a mini factory, kicking out 1,000 Sambusas daily. I'm curious as somebody who grew up in Somalia and then you came here and you're trying to start an operation where you're making food. Was that a huge difference in being able to get stuff done here versus the place where you came from? Absolutely. They're quite different. In Somalia, it's a male-dominated world. I don't think I would even dream of creating and starting anything of my own. Here, the beauty of America, it's there is a sense of engaging and wanting uh, not only minorities but women to initiate and be entrepreneurs and there are system is in place right. that really support you. Were there any regulations that surprised you where you're like, oh, you have to do that too? Yes, I think it was just the gloves. We didn't even touch anything. I mean, I changed this glove to call my son and now I have to change the whole thing. In America, food is very, very regulated. It's not something we're so used to, it, but we have learned because that's the process for us to create this beautiful thing. Mm. Miriam. Thank you so much for sharing your food, but even more sharing your Thank story. Thank you so much. Oh, greasy hands, I'm sorry. <laughs> like Miriam, if you're introducing cuisine to a new demographic, you may need to adjust to the local palate. Mm -hmm. If you're bringing African food to the Midwest, instead of starting with this... Are we eating a baby? Yes. You may need to start with this. 
Imagine Chipotle, but with African flair and Somali spices. Jamal calls it African fast casual. Chef Musa and owner Kahim call it Afro Deli and Grill. They've been doing this for 11 years with a menu that introduces fresh African flavors to folks in the Twin Cities. There was one African word, maybe you could help me pronounce it, uh, quesadilla? Is that, is that a Somali word? No, quesadilla is quesadilla. Oh, there's quesadilla. Yes, we had to introduce a little bit of everything because we have a large population of Latinos, but we had the core of our menu. It's East African, it's Somali menu. Minnesota is evermore becoming a state of adventurous eaters, but there are still those who might consider black pepper to be a bit too spicy. If you make an original food, somebody from here will be overwhelmed by the spice, by the scents, by everything. So, this restaurant has carefully crafted a culinary experience that's equal parts adventurous and inviting. Their menu fuses African, Mediterranean, and American foods. Sort of like the chop suey, how Chinese people were able to introduce that. Mm. Orange chicken is not Chinese food, but it's how Chinese American food translates. So this is how Somali American food sort of evolves. Involves. It's the perfect entry point to, as they say, taste Africa. But I've already tasted Africa, and I want more. I want this. Afro Deli and Grill also caters. What's on the menu? Roasted goat. Cooked whole. Dry rub the outside of the goat with berberet, garlic powder, lemon pepper, cumin, nutmeg, and crushed cardamom. On the inside, moist rub with a mixture of garlic, soy sauce, lemon juice, and bay leaves. Stuff in some carrots, potatoes, celery, and onion. Then roast it in the oven for six hours. When you're in Africa, what is the occasion for such an item? Like this, like an entire goat? Weddings. Special people. Mm -hmm. Actually, the baby goats, that's all the special. Not the goats. Are we eating a baby? Yes. Oh, do you know what a baby goat is called? A kid. Oh, yeah. So we're eating kids. But it's allowed kids, okay? I know. <laughs> Joining our meal, Somali singer Ms. Hibo Nura and Halima Aiden, the first professional American model to wear a hijab. I'm used to this by now. I got trained earlier. The hand, the right hand to be specific. Right. And say Bismillah. It's a how to bless with any meal. Yeah. Bismillah. Yes. So anything I want, we all share together. Yes, but don't expect me to feed you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a big shoulder here. Oh my gosh, it is so soft. This is, this is to die for. I can really tell this was made with love and time because this meat is not gamey at all. It's soft, the fat has rendered down. Like it's breaking apart at my fingertips. It's so delicious. What did you do? Usually a good like this, we will marinate it overnight. Let it sit, get the muscles loosen up a little bit and average five to six hours to cook it. One thing I notice is when I'm making goat is it's not one of those meats that you can rush. So if you cook it in a high temp, it tenses up. So you have to cook it with intention. You have to cook it with love. You gotta tell it to relax. Take the day off. Yeah. <laughs> I love that you have a menu that's very like uh, accessible, a lot of familiar items on there, but I think you could throw goat meat on there. If we start goat meat serving at the restaurant, the country will be out of goat because we don't, we don't have that many goats. Is it hard to get goats here? Yes, we get the thing from Austra Australia and New Zealand. That's what the, most of the goats came. I love the idea of you guys preserving your culture and sharing it at the same time. I think there's this idea that people should come here and be American, but I really believe that's just a small percentage of people who absolutely believe that. Everybody can bring their culture, everybody can share their culture. There's a difference between the culture and the kind of like government and system yes. you came from. Yes. And people aren't always able to separate those two. Reach me from my winter hell. I think a lot of people, when they speak of cultures, America is a melting pot. It's a bit of every culture. So there's not only just one dimension, but a 360. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that every culture brings a little bit of right. the world together, and that's how we have the full pie. So you keeping that tradition, you bringing it here, it's not taking away from America, it's adding it's to it. It's adding to it. How have you seen the Somali community transform here? 
We evolved. I remember 1999, 2000, there were only one community center or a prayer of like a masjid. But now we have about maybe 100 community centers. Wow. And a museum. And museums, restaurants, we have everything. We have a clinics, we have a coffee shops, gas stations, and we have a mainstream restaurants like Afro Daily all over the state. Do you think that's because of the number of Somali people or is it because of the actions of the people who are here? Actually, this is who we are. Somalis are very you know, entrepreneurial uh, people. Everywhere that we go, we are very visible, very active. So we usually adapt easily in any culture, but at the same time we keep our traditions and cultures in religion. So we stick together and I, I think that our success came from, uh, you know, community uh, vibe and community culture. Incredible. Guys, thank you so much for spending so much time with me. To you for making this go on very, very short notice. It's beautiful, it's delicious. This is uh, an incredible experience for me, so thank you. Thank you. Influencer doesn't require millions of fans. All you need is this t-shirt. Entertain and inspire at your own pace. Don't be an influencer. Be a micro-influencer. Get your shirt now. You have to taste it with the sauce. Oh, we didn't try the sauce yet. Oh, we yeah. All right. Like well, you gotta get another one. How yeah. many do you eat so far? I ate one. Just I, one? I ate one or two. <laughs> Bananas are sort of to reset your palate. Okay, like cheese at a wine tasting. Like cheese at a wine tasting. Exactly. Wine, wine tasting. Wine tasting. Cool. Can wine you figure out the exposure between us? Can you find something in the middle? <laughs> Yeah, the best I can. Okay. <laughs> can you talk about entrepreneurship in America? What are you able to do here that you couldn't do anywhere else? Wow, that's a good question. Thanks. I smell the fresh green chilies. Yes. Oh, really, really. But I'm like, where's the heat? We take the seeds out mm. for Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say that. Boom, another video in the can. Thank you so much to my man, Jamal. I had a great time. Thank Absolutely. you so much, dude. Absolutely. Thanks for coming with us today. You can learn more about Jamal and his journey here at his Instagram. Go ahead and give him a follow right now. That is it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. A peace. Do you want to say it? Say peace. 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 All right, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>